I'm here today with the legendary vintage classic GX600. Well, is it really a vintage classic? I don't know, but it is from the early 90s, and I couldn't get an exact date on when this model was released, but uh, I think they were around as early as 1993, and I just scored this one today for only $80 at a pro audio repair shop. So I know it's been inspected at least, and everything should be working. It should have been cleaned, hopefully. Uh, I did clean up the cabinet a little bit. It looks, for some reason, like someone took all the Tolex off. I mean, they clearly did. There's no Tolex remaining. And they painted the front of it, which is just a, like, particle board. They painted this with a shiny gloss black, but everything else is kind of a matte black. And then they reattached the logo. I don't know if the Tolex was falling apart or if they thought it would look cooler like wood, but it's um, not the most pleasant feeling. But hey, who cares how it feels? So this is a classic 90s solid state amp that has a reputation in the world of death metal because a very similar amp was used by Cannibal Corpse. And I kind of heard about this series from Taylor Danley. He did one on the G130C, which is what... Uh, Cannibal Corpse used on some of their early records. This is the GX600. It's a 60 watt model. It should essentially sound the same as the G130C. And it's also apparently very similar to the Ampeg VH140C. That's another solid state amp from the early 90s. And it has a real spring reverb, which for a 60 watt head with a spring reverb, two channels, that's kind of classic for $80. I'll take it. That's a great deal. I couldn't pass it up, even though I don't really need it. On top, we've got some friends for it. The HM2, of course, the Boss OD3, the Clon Clone, and uh, the Noise Suppressor, just to keep things a little under control. The cab is a Carvin Legacy 412 with vintage 30s from 2002, which are made in China. First year they made them in China. And then I've got the ATM41 and the SM57 both positioned on the cap edge of the speaker. And this is the good speaker. I know I've tested them all out and this is the best sounding one. The ATM41 also has a place in history as a Swedish death metal mic. So I bought one of those and I managed to score this one for only $30, which was a nice deal. It's a dynamic mic. It's a little darker or softer on the top end as well as less bass than the 57. So I actually really like it as an alternative to the 57 and I really like the 57. So it's a cool mic. I've got a lot more IRs coming soon too uh, with different speakers in this 412 as well as plenty more of the V30 with some different mics this time. So I've just got to get through doing all the documentation and recording all of them and putting together a video. So stay tuned for those.
So this is a solid state amp. It does have a real spring reverb. So let's start on the clean channel and just hear how that spring reverb sounds and how the clean channel performs. Does it sound warm or does it sound sterile? So that's without the reverb, and I've just got all the controls set at noon. So let's try, I do have the bright switch engaged too, which I think it just sounds better. I like I like a bright switch. Let's put up the spring reverb. It gets pretty wet uh, pretty quick. And with a little of the clon action. probably not here for the clean tones, but it actually has quite a nice clean channel. It doesn't really seem to break up at all. It seems to be totally clean, but it doesn't sound sterile. And it's got a nice, it's got that, that nice tube warmth that you want from a solid state amp. Uh, so I like it. And the spring reverb sounds good. So it's got more than enough reverb on tap for anything you'd want. So let's kick it up a notch with the overdrive channel. See how bad this bad boy gets. <laughs> So rather than a mid control, it's got a shape or contour control that does the mid scoop, but it also does a bass boost and a cut. So we can either go for a pretty nice warm mid sound with it all the way down, or we can go full on into scoop territory. And it sounds pretty nice with it on the lower half. I'm not probably going to scoop it to death, but I mean, hey, if we're talking 90s death metal, maybe we should. <laughs> Bye. 
like that. I feel like it could be slightly better, but that's why we have some overdrive here. Uh, but overall, I like that. I've got the gain almost all the way up, and I'm actually running the the scoop, the shape button here at about six. I think that sounds good for a metal tone. It gets maybe a little too midi be before that. Trouble and bass are just basically at noon, so nothing too extreme going on, and it sounds pretty nice. So let's try out our our clon here. I'm going to roll off. I don't have a tube screamer, sorry, but this does do a similar thing. I'm going to roll off the gain and otherwise set it up pretty much like I would with a tube screamer. This has a lot of output, so I don't think I'm going to run it all the way, or maybe I will. I like the clon. That immediately makes it sound a little bit, a little bit nicer, a little tighter on the low end, and uh, just sounds a little bit, a little bit better. <laughs> You know, it's got a particular sort of high-end fizziness that I don't entirely love, but even turning down the highs all the way doesn't really get rid of that. It sounds to me like it's like somewhere 10k or above. I could probably cut it out with uh, some EQ and post, but it does have a little bit of that solid statiness. That's something that I think is more of a flaw than a tone quality. Otherwise, I mean, I think the gain sounds cool. It does have some of that raw chunkiness to it. And uh, so, yeah, let's check out the OD3. Now, this one doesn't have a low roll-off, really. It's much flatter, and so it doesn't quite do what the Klon does, but we're going to test it out for fun. So the shape control here, you know, right around five, around noon is good. And if you go to about four, you know, you get a little more of those mids and it kind of makes it sound more like a real tube amp or a more modern tone, I guess. Right around four, it sounds pretty nice and kind of got that modern mid push. And right up to about six, you get a, a pretty nice scoop tone without going overboard. But I wouldn't really use it much outside of that range because I think it gets either too midi and uh, it also seems to get louder as you go to the left as you add mids it gets louder and as you go to the right and scoop the mids it gets quieter so interesting but I think leaving it right around noon and going a little to the left or the right you can get a nice variety of tones there and get the character you want without uh, really going too far in either direction <laughs> So 
So the last thing to check out is the HM2. And I can already tell you, based on this, I think it's going to work. But I'm going to drop the gain on this. I'm going to set the EQ. Actually, having this a little more mid-focused might help with the HM2. Just going to reset the others to noon. Turn this off. We're just in the standard mode on the HM2 right now. I've got the chainsaw going. But I like to leave the gain pretty low because I think it just adds noise. And it doesn't really add a whole lot of extra brutality in a good way. <laughs> I like this shape control with the HM2 because by turning it back a little bit to the left, getting more of the mid push, it does help with the HM2, which is already so scooped that if you try to scoop it more, it just, it doesn't work so well. I checked out the PV Bandit when I bought it a couple months ago, and that's also a classic amp with the HM2. Now, later versions did have a mid control, but mine does not. That's sort of one downside to it is that you know, you, you just have a low and high control, and so does the HM2, and so you don't have as many EQ options unless you go and you just record it straight into the computer, do some EQ there. That's fine. It works, but it's nice to have it on the amp, and if you're going to use it live, having an option to push some more mids really works well with this, and this one does have a nice control for that very purpose. I like it. I think it works. I mean, the HM2, someone's always got a comment that the HM2 sounds terrible. Well, that's just like your opinion, man. So deal with it. <laughs> but it's still important to find the best sound for the HM2 for those people who enjoy the finer things in life. <laughs> roll off the output volume and add a little bit of gain on the clon this time and just see if we can get sort of at a combination of gain from the amp and from the clon. <laughs> So there you have it, the Crate GX600. I think it actually sounds killer 
with the Klon boosting it and adding a little bit of gain there and some gain here and kind of, well, this is right in the right in the middle. Got everything just about to noon. Rolled off the base a little bit, rolled off the treble a touch. Got the shape control at noon and uh, tone at noon on the Klon. And that sounds that sounds pretty pretty darn good to me. I'm gonna have to see in post and do some do some tests, some recording, and get a little more analytical with it. But I think it sounds pretty great. And besides a, a slight fizzy high end, that's the only thing that I kind of don't love about it. And that's not necessarily always just a solid state thing either. But it is sort of present here. So that's the only real complaint I have. I'm going to have to find out kind of what, what mics, what speakers it really jives with, but it sounds great on the V30. It sounds great on the 412. It sounds big, and I mean, hearing it in a mix, I wouldn't guess that it's solid state. I kind of like the solid state rawness that these kind of amps can bring, but, you know, depending on how you have it set up, it doesn't really have to sound solid state and raw either. You know, it sounds it sounds pretty darn good. I'd say. And it works well with the HM2. That's always important. I do think solid state amps, they just, they jive with the HM2. And that's, that's always good for me. This amp in particular works quite nicely with it. And I like the PV Bandit. That's a pretty sick sounding amp, but this is a good, uh, good alternative, a little easier for recording since I can just plug in any speakers I want. And it's got a line out on the front. It's got a line in. You want to, I don't know, plug your recorder in there, uh, play some loops through it, or put it out, you know, run it out to your, your cassette uh, Tascam Porter Studio, just like we did in the 90s, except I was, I was a little boy, you know, playing Mario 64, that's what I did in the 90s. So anyways, that's, uh, that's the Crate GX600, I hope you've enjoyed this, I hope you've learned a lot about the history of solid state amplification in America. Or something like that. Anyways, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.